unbegrifflich, unbedenklich, Spektrum. Ich muss ihn, wie gesagt, nicht vorstellen. Fefe. Yeah, good morning. I'm happy the, the audience, there's such a lot of audience here. This, this talk is, well, I have to do some expectation management and because last year I submitted a different different talk and about TCP minimization and would be a little bit too technical as a programmer. That one was uh, declined, uh, so I tried again this year. Uh, so I, but I, I didn't want to make the uh, 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 the the assumption that I want to annoy the people, so I just handed in another talk. Um, that's the one that got accepted, and I had to prepare it real quick now. So it's more like a thought process instead of a structured presentation. I hope it will be helpful uh, anyway. So I'll, I'll just start. There are multiple ways to come to the conclusion, but I'll, I'll just let you participate here. So I started relatively early in my career, and I decided to never write software uh, where life depends upon, and like like medicine, medicine devices or nuclear power, military, no way. But then I met someone that wrote code for nuclear uh, reactors, and he said, oh, that was really, really easy. So if the if the people who can estimate their uh, can't uh, estimate their limits, then someone else would do it. Uh, that's not supposed to be a generalization. I also met someone else who wasn't like this, but there's this kind of persons. So the problem at this at this point is that that you learn program by doing. It's, it's not really a course you do, you just walk around and yeah, test your limits. It also means that, by definition, you don't know these limits because that's what you want to find. This also means that all the people always work on their limits. So if people write software, then they go as far as they think they can. And that means, uh, in the contrary, that the technology that, that is being rolled out out there is not just like well understood things, but it's these technologies that the person understood just quite. And that's a problem. And this is being um, being made even worse that we have like this modularity and dependency wave that people just use modules of someone else and without without a foundation in reality that the one who wrote this, he just he must know what he was doing. And that's exactly not the case, it's just like people like you and me who also did this in an explorative way. So you can think of this yourself if you do a thought experiment, you could uh, watch this live. So let's assume that someone found a way to deal with complexity better, like modularity or object-oriented programming. And then you would hope that the, the software that that is prescribed will be done better in a better way. But that's not what happens. What's happened is now we write bigger software and again work on our limits. I think that's not a problem of software development. It's, it's I think it's generally a pr problem with humans. That's what evolution made of us. And we have to learn to deal with this. So I have a theory, I, I call this the gradient theory. And the thesis is that the uh, people, that humans uh, uh, see their environment as, as, uh, as an optimization uh, process and they're looking for the lowest and the highest points. And they don't, they don't uh, do this in a, in a very precise way, they have to make assumptions, it's more or less random. So if it's if it's cold, you don't just go to the radiator and just put it like you want it, and you put it on hot, and then you wait until it gets too hot, and then you turn it down again. And that's not only with radiators; it's also with, with cars, with driving around. If we have a map, where's the limit? Where do we have to turn? And the path there, we just ignore it because even though it might be even not very very nice. Also, the choice of speed, we just we just accelerate until we feel unwell, and then we take a step back. 
If we look up something in a dictionary or in the telephone book, we make an assumption where it is, more or less, and if it's too far, we just go back. So the elementary part is we have an assumption that the uh, that the map lo looks around here, so we have some smooth uh, transitions. That's called gradient descent, this process. So you always try to follow the, the gravity to find the lowest point. But it doesn't work in two cases. The first one is if there is a cliff. Uh, when I walk over there, I can go back. And it also doesn't work well if you realize that you went too far. That's the same thing with a cliff. And the second problem is that if you can't roll back from for a different reason. That's, that's also something you have in uh, software development. And it turns out that that's these kind of problems that people have, for example, for example, like a two-week trial um, subscription, and people forget to, to, to leave again, or drug addiction, or gaming addiction. And in, in software development or proje project management, we already invested so much, we just can't go back now. Security isn't a gradient. It may look like one, but it's not. It's not. And that's the probably the, the foundational problem of IT security. You don't realize if you went too far, you only realize it when you get hacked and then there's no way back because the data is gone. Complexity, complexity is similarly uh, to security also a gradient. Uh, it's, it feels like a gradient, but it really isn't. It feels like we have everything under control and at some point when we realize we don't, then we can't go back. Also giving data away is also a pseudo gradient. At the point when you realize that you gave out too much, then that's too late. So the conclusion is that complexity is evil. We realize them it's too late and uh, we catch it too easily and we have to uh, do something against that. And the cost will be given away to our clients if we do it professionally or to our users and also to our future self. So that's why you very rarely find <laughs> elderly software developers that are happy. So that's, the first that me in so that's the first thought process that, that led me in this direction. And the second one is, for this I, I, I take out the GNU manifesto, I don't want to bash GNU in any way, but that was the original uh, um, announcement he Stallman wrote, we make Unix programs, but we, don't, we, don't, we won't be the same as Unix, Unix, and yeah, we'll make all improvements that are convenient. That's a very, uh, very nasty sentence. Convenient for who? But that's the approach a lot of people have that write software. Oh, we can add this real quick. And what's what's missing is a kind of corrective. So so what kind of legacy do I do I put on my back right now? So the, so. Then that's that's our <laughs> that's our uh, uh, heritage hereditary sin in software development, and I think the only way to get rid of this is if you throw away the whole software, the whole module, and start again. But software just doesn't die. So working with software, I only realized uh, <laughs> it's hard if people die because that's a corrective the system ne needs and uh, that's why software has to yeah, die and that's but it's not what's happening it's a feature that things don't live forever we have in general we can see this if someone wants to extend the software in order to solve a specific problem or a more general problem then people will always try to solve the more general problem and that's what you can see almost everywhere. There's only a very few uh, exceptions. And I had my my uh, realization that when I uh, looked at the project, um, it was just some checkout. Uh, on my own web server, I have a GD GDB in it, a config configuration file for the GNU debugger. That says, for example, call the program if you want to debug it with these parameters. And I write in there, don't use port 80, but instead use port some, some other port, like 80, 50. And GDB started one day to, mm, no, I won't take this GDB init file anymore, because it's in a folder that, that's not been, um, that's not been uh, agreed upon. And that's, that's a thing uh, to, to correct something after the deed. So it realized, oh, well, our configuration file became so powerful, so it's been a security risk, and so they just nailed it down, and they closed it up. 
Uh, and that's that's that that's that broke more than than necessary. It was very annoying for me. You can add an automatic path, but that's when I realized it for the first time. It was a couple of years ago. I don't know exactly when. There was a similar case with Vim. That's an editor that I very often use. You can do something like uh, put something in a commentary. Uh, the last three uh, three lines of a file, you can set some config files, for example, setting a tab stop of four. But the parser has a security uh, uh, problem, so it was possible to create a file that it has that would be executed if, if it's opened in Vim. That's not what they wanted to do with this feature, but that's the same problem in green. And you can generalize this problem. Um, General generalization is good, but not in software. So we have this example here. Uh, so for example, we have a, f a CSV file with travel tickets. Uh, We're interested in f the fourth column. For example, it looks like this. So I want to sum up the fourth column. So first I take uh, use cut. We're in Unix, so it filters it out. The first, uh, first f uh, line has to go. So with a tail, we remove the first line. I can use another uh, tool to add stuff, and then I have to compute it. But, but what happens if instead of one there's there's Fred or just a string? Then we realize, okay, cut doesn't have a problem with that a tail as well, a tail neither, and paste neither. But BC fails spectacularly. So that means. Even worse, BC is programmable. For, for example, that could be the Ackermann function, and then the your, your PC would stand there for an hour trying to res resolve the recursion. And I think it uh, makes sense to introduce a concept here and say cut tail and paste are harmless, but BC is not. All right, that's a thought I had, and I thought, okay, I could make a talk about that, although it's not sufficient. There's a, a couple of uh, uh, things of harmlessness. So let's formulate it like this. Software is harmless if unexpected input is not leading to unexpected behavior um, or random outputs. So SHA um, sum would be harmless or word count. So you could say use AWK. So here we don't have a problem if there's thread instead of four. That looks better. But is it ha really harmless? And it turns out it's another form of not harmless because you can have code and change the OS system. So I now have to check the code that I put in at the command line. In the industry, this is a big problem. The gaming industry now changed it to use interpreters in their uh, games and the business logic, not the AI, but small scripts. So they could write those small logics in a script language and the script interpreter is Lua and that is used because it can't do anything that you haven't explicitly allowed it. So it can't open sockets, it can't open files. You can allow that and then you have a problem, but that is a real problem. A lot of open source people don't think about this because, well, I just deliver, it's not my problem, but I think that's something we in general have to think about and before we deliver, when we program. So this is another kind of harmlessness. Before, the harmlessness was the input cannot produce unexpected outcomes, but now the program itself can produce that. And that's the problem nowadays. And the topic about sandboxing is preventing programs, uh, programs from doing bad things. So at the PC can burn um, calculation time, if AWK can do other things, and GNU AWK can open sockets for no reason. So AWK can write in the OS system, but I have that read-only mounted, so it's not a problem. But now this, again, is not harmless. Bash can op also open sockets. I don't know how many of you knew that. Okay, so this goes further, of course. Um, after AWK came Perl, then and Perl can do eval, 
and that is one of the most terrible things you can have in an OS. And you can also look at browsers, of course. Let's look at Netscape. Netscape had the choice between useful and harmless several times and always chose useful. I don't know who remembers the Flash plugin, but before that everyone had the real player and the Acrobat plugin that used to exist. And all of that was shit because that was all native code that could do everything the US could do. So that was very useful, but it was also very dangerous. And that was, that was uh, a choice they made. So the actual goal is to make the programmers amongst you aware that this is a real problem and what a r such a program can do. So the next iteration was we do everything in JavaScript. That looked better at first, but JavaScript then was running with enough rights and privileges to do real harm. And then it turned out that most people have their important data in the browser already and that's enough to cause real harm. So that had to be corrected. Chrome now limits the ad blocker in order to protect against other things. And we have the same problems in, uh, again. Now under Windows, I don't know who uses it, we have the problem with uh, auto runs. That's officially um, Microsoft now. And the only function is to list programs of in the system. And it's not about the thing down here or the size of the scroll, but how many plugs there are. And that's all options how plugins can hook into the system. And nobody has an overview about this because there's too many. And this is a core problem to this. And there's a third way to look at this. It's my security everyday life. So normally I get source code and I look at that and look for bugs and then I tell them what bugs I found and sometimes there's cases where I find a lot of bugs. Maybe not just the ones I find, but some they have a database full of bugs where other people found and there is seven digit number of bugs in there. And that's because they have so many bugs there are other strategies to fix this. So. They say, for example, if the bug is not that important, well, I'll fix it later, which in reality means never. So I'm trying to et uh, establish the term bug wave, which comes from the shipping industry, which is a pun, but it hasn't established itself yet. So this is a dump where bugs are stored forever. And recently I've got the bug ID or 15 million, which is a bad, 1.5 million, which is a bad idea, a uh, bad sign already, but at least I got one. So it's not especially bad, it just has an open tracker so I can establish how bad it is. My oldest Firefox bug from 23, uh, 2003 had an ID of 200,000, so that's what happened in the meantime. And if we look at the numbers, we can see it grows exponentially. And it's not like the bugs go away at some point. I have two big events where uh, there are two big events when bugs are closed, when there's a new release. So that's when you close all the old bugs and then it looks like something happened. And the other step is this. So Mozilla closed a bug. After a period of inactivity. So, die war jetzt nicht von mir, die yeah. inactivity. Ich den so Mozilla, Mozilla closed a bug after a period of inactivity. It wasn't my, in my inactivity, but Mozilla didn't do anything, so they closed it automatically. It, not because they fixed it. So, that's not to say Mozilla is, is especially bad, it's just that everything is open, so I can show it. So, this is what happens with bugs. Unimportant bugs will never be fixed. So everyone calls all their bugs important, so they get fixed. So now the important bugs are not fixed anymore because it's too many. So now people call their bugs security bugs. So now we have a wave of security bugs and now the hackling begins. Is it really a security bug? Is it just a crash? Yeah. 
And the point of all this is that this is an unholy alliance of another trend. So companies see that there are so many bugs that the goal cannot be to get rid of them all. Instead, they establish metrics and they say, well, we are doing fuzzing. In itself, not a bad idea, but it's not for finding all bugs. It's just the first step on a long road. But it's a nice metric that you can get out of this. So we did this and this test and now we don't really know if it's better or worse than before. And now there's bug bounty, which I personally find is bullshit. That's so the PR, ca uh, the public relations people can say, well, we do something, this works, and that's bullshit. And the rest of the industry just did mitigations. We are not closing the bugs, but we are making uh, we make it more difficult to exploit them. And now I have to eat my head because actually it's working, but there are side effects. I don't know if I have time for anecdotes because I, time is tight. So I once met the guy who handles the Internet Explorer bugs and I met him because I filed 50 bucks and he said, well, 35 I knew before. And I said, what? So the guy looked like Gollum in a cave. He was 30 and looked like end of 60. And he said, well, there come so many bugs in here. We have no chance of closing them. We are just collecting them. This got better by now. And Microsoft is not doing nothing. This, these are only examples. So this is all of the companies. Nobody is really closing bugs anymore. And then there was another thing I can't, couldn't talk about for years, but now I can because they op published it themselves and they noticed that they had a lot of memory exception bugs because the heap wasn't really freed and now they built something where it wasn't freed but put into a list and then it runs over the stack and looks for pointers that point into this list and does not free that. So it's a terrible hack. I would be ashamed to talk about this, but Microsoft uses this for a metric now and the Chrome people said, well, this looks amazing. And that's the state of the art, how the industry works. Now the problem is, bugs are only accepted as a security problem if there is an exploit. That's not in every industry, but in many. If you don't have an exploit, it's not accepted as a serious bugs. But only accepted security bugs are ever fixed, so bugs just lie open because you couldn't prove that it is a pro uh, proper bug and because they are fixing things by making exploiting more difficult, it's more and more difficult to really prove that it's a bug. That doesn't mean that no bug is ever closed because apparently some programmers have <laughs> um, have some honor and they nobody wants to build the bridge in Genoa that then sometime breaks down catastrophically but there are a cascade of problems in reality but for me what follows is that reactive security does not work I'm saying that for a long time now that with viruses and malware it doesn't really work like that. I'm calling antivirus software snake oil and yeah, we um, and the whole approach that we just deliver and they test it and then we fix the bugs, that doesn't work. There is a by now a, a proverb, you are delivering software if the updater is working and yeah, that doesn't That's the state of the art in the industry. So we are, as developers, what are we doing? So there are several ideas. The FDP uh, idea, that's the Liberal Party in Germany. Um, the market will solve this. Well, that didn't work. People still buy it. Then there is the CDU, another party, uh, conservative party in Germany. We apply our people's honors and that didn't work. Then the um, Department of the Interior Safety, we use snake oil, also didn't work, and the Twitter uh, uh, um, idea, we throw shit and just, yeah, make people bad. Then there's the 
apply approach that the Catholic Church uses. So not the market will solve this, but St. Peter. And we use the honor system. And yeah, that works a little bit. So what are we doing? First, I thought maybe we should you uh, divide explorative software development from goal-oriented software development. So learning exploratively is a good thing, but you shouldn't use that approach for really developing software. And so I'm talking with the companies, please give the people time for learning. Otherwise, they will learn it while doing and uh, while working on your product. But I can talk a lot about this until I get turn blue. It doesn't work so far. So I think we can easily say be, be creative with what you do, not how you do it. So a company should d develop new things, be innovative, be creative, but then they shouldn't use some experimental data tech and then lose the data because it wasn't finished yet. I think there's not just one root cause to that. There are many component, components that have to be looked at individually. First is lack of knowledge. Uh, I don't know that this code was shit and I didn't know how to do it better. And then there's what I call um, wrongful uh, un, uh, ignorance. We didn't find people. Because I think if you want to and you pay people well, then you will find people... Um, this, I, I think this is uh, just an excuse. Many people say, like, couldn't do it, we just had bad people, uh, it wasn't my fault. I think it's just an excuse. And there's real incompetence. Uh, I had a customer recently, it doesn't look like, like an ex excuse, it looks like a best practice, but I think it's an excuse. Recently I had a customer, they said they do a platform for energy trade, critical infrastructure. They said, like, we're using the cloud, we can't host this ourselves. It's, it's too expensive. I don't get it. I think we have a cascade of excuses that should be pushed in front of us. And, and the approach I want to follow now is that we try to implement a, a metric of a legacy factor it's not about how bad the software is, but how much uh, it will influence my software negatively if I have this as a dependency. So how much negative effect if I get this into my code. The problem, if we have this as a, metrics, as a metric and it's a successful metric, then people will cheat the system and optimize the metric and not for the actual goal. So because of that, it's kind of hard, but there's a role model that is actually quite w working, that's CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System, where, where we have a, a measure of how problematic bugs are. People try to define a metric. It works well in the industry, people accept this, the people love it. It roughly works like this, like uh, risk assessment historically, you see how likely it is and how much damage it will do. Is this, is this hard to exploit? Do you need an account for this? Does it work across the network? And how much can break if, if, if this is exploited? Like you can delete data, you click a number of boxes and then you get a score for it. I think it's a good thing. We need a risk score like that, but not for bugs maybe. It's easier for bugs, although this has problems in detail. But actually we need a kind of risk score, either for, for management or for the developers themselves. These are two separate problems. I think it's more goal-oriented to stick with the developers because until now I have never actually witnessed that uh, a management will say we need to do this and it's not, not just meant for PR reasons. So if you help people realize that they're doing, uh, they're actually making a mistake, we can actually change things. It's a multidimensional problem. And one of the dimensions I came up with, security holes. Uh, of course, th it's a problem if there are security holes in the, in the project. It's an open field of uh, research. Uh, you can say, well, we have found 10 bugs, so the code was insecure, maybe. Uh, uh, but um, we don't know if we found all the bugs in the code. The rest of the code might just be superb, and this was just a, just a, just a fluke. And, um, 
it's maybe not a good metric here. In the industry, they try to do static code analysis and look for code smells. It's a thing that many companies are trying right now. Uh, success rate is not really high. I observe that people are using such a tool that generates 10 billion warnings and people gradually reduce sensitivity of this tool that uh, they have reasonable uh, uh, values and developers get the, the filtered data and say it's all false positives and the project is still running but uh, so they don't want it to look like it's failed but uh, no, it's not working. It's a good dimension but we can not implement this well. I wouldn't know how. Okay, um, I try to give examples here uh, for illustration. Um, extremes are Qmail and Sendmail. That's a good example there. Both are MTAs, mail transfer agents, uh, server programs that transfer emails. Qmail has been built with the goal to have a secure software um, modeled after an initial design. And Sendmail has been built and retroactively fitted with um, security measures. And you can see that up until this day, um, Gmail has been released in 1993 and there has never been a patch. And I'm using it up until this day because there have never been problems really. That's one end of the spectrum. And on the other side, that means that you don't get any new features. There's a double-edged sword. It's a spectrum, old legacy code that no one really wants to manage unless they're paid for it. And even with the people who are paid to do it, they run away. Second dimension is that you can think about, is this still maintained actively? Well, you can see this with open source projects. You can see this well there. Um, other software, it's more difficult with patches, but you don't know if they are actually changing things or how much. It's not really clear how to how to um, value this. If a software doesn't get any updates, doesn't mean it's shit. It might just mean it's complete. It's really, really uh, rare, but uh, Tech is an example for that for, uh, by Donald Knuff. It's, he wrote it and it's done. There are a few patches from time to time, but uh, they change a few bits somewhere, but uh, it's basically complete. Um, my, my example here was JPEG, libjpeg, and it hasn't needed any updates, didn't have any uh, security issues. doesn't mean it's a bad software, so it's not as easy to say that the software is bad if there are no patches anymore. This metric is also very difficult. So how are we doing this? Good question. I just said that already. On the other hand, if you update the software often, it's not a good sign either. I have a customer who's got a third-party software that is released uh, via GitHub, and he gets five updates each day, and it's and they all say they are releases, and um, sometimes they break. You can never really tell if the software is good because when you're finished investigating, there are 20 new versions already. It's also not good either. Another dimension is dependency hell. You all know this if you have developed software in your life. It's a crass example with JavaScript. They uh, had some public blunders when modules were recalled where it turned out that some transitive dependencies in almost all projects you would need to use this in a transitive manner so you need to sum this metric up. The extremes of the spectrum are on the one hand cloud login hell where you do not see the dependencies, just some kind of pipeline with some output at the end, and uh, automated resolution of dependencies during build and uh, getting software from the internet. And the other extreme is QMIL without any dependencies. It just uses uh, the C runtime and dependencies, and that, that's basically it. 
Uh, there's also a spectrum here that could be used for a metric, but uh, there are many dimensions, as I said. Next dimension is code quality. It's a bit like security, but I want to generalize this because, among other things, because there's a strong correlation between many bugs and bad security. All security problems are also bugs. So if you have many normal bugs or many bugs of which we don't know that they are security issues, then it's usually a sign that there's a lot of insecure stuff. It's important as a metric, even though it might not be about security. As I said, the trend is static code analysis and detection of code smells. I would actually be in for uh, uh, in favor of 100% code coverage, but it's also difficult because there are different ways to measure this. Because what do you do if there are more than one statement in one line? What's the quality of testing? It's not that easy, but we should start thinking about it. My suggestion would be from the reasons I stated before that um, if you um, if you have the bugs that get known for each year, each year you can extrapolate um, and switch on compiler warnings. Uh, very, very few um, manufacturers are actually doing this. This is really scary. And many people who have pipelines in the cloud don't really see is how many warnings there actually are. It's one of the most important metrics that you as developers have. Um, don't throw away compiler warnings. Not with a pragma statement, but next dimension. Well, what kind of expectation does, does pe do people have? And I realized that, that I think in LibXF2, that's a software to read metadata in, in images, like co GPS coordinates, which lens was, lens was used. And that's more or less well defined, how the standard has to look. There's an open source library, and there were a lot of bugs in there. So, so then the author of this software just wrote, then, yeah, well, well, then just don't use this on untrustworthy files. So he never had the, expecta uh, never had the uh, expectation to, to have th that the software is safe. So the people used the sa uh, software and just assumed, yeah, I think he took care of that. So, so I think the thing we could do is um, to do is just to to write to, to annotate the software with uh, what the expectations on on the software are. And I think that's very important. Another thing is that people m create features that sound like security. That's something I, I saw with Microsoft very often. There's a feature called network access protection. So I went there for threat mod modeling and so, uh, what what do you then they said, no, no, it's not a security feature. And then I said, well, then maybe the name is a little bit confusing, but things like this happen. So that because there's a disconnect between the people who make the project and choose the name and do the marketing. Yeah. There's also graduations here. There's explorative software. So every open source software that I published is, op is explorative. It's not meant negatively because it's the best way to learn s to how to program. So I understood something after the first time I implemented it. And it doesn't mean that the implementation is good. That's what I'm trying to do, but it's important to com communi communicate this. This code was explorative. M might mean that maybe it's well, well used and um, maybe you can trust it, but the approach was explorative. Or there's a scenario where the guy left. You see this sometimes in big corporations, so there's there's a piece of code, but we don't know who wrote it, but we know who wrote it, and, but he doesn't have any time anymore for this. Or if he's just uh, retired, all, all these things can happen. But it's important that you communicate this, because people who use this, they don't know this. Or uh, the best scenario, I think, uh, if the if the guy who develops this is also the maintainer, and the one who tries to commercially market it, because he has an interest, he is interested in that the software really works. There's even more dimensions. I'm sorry, this is such a complex problem. There's also the problem that the guy who want to does this has the best intentions and uses the best techniques. 
but it could be that the specs he's he's uh, doing that that the spec is really bad. For example, in XML says there's an entity expansion and we can use a very simple uh, DOS exploit on any kind of XML parser. So everyone added configuration where you could disable this, but then you not standard conform anymore. This happens a lot that, that specs are bad. I don't want to point at XML. There's others who are not good. Same thing with JSON parsers. People went around and opened a lot of recursion depth and all the parser uh, exploded. Window message is the same on Windows because that was in it was invented before there was more than one user. Message bus in general that uh, occurs often in cloud installation and big corporations. So if you do this over the database, it's too slow. So we add another message bus here. And then everyone has access to the message bus, can also spoof things and see all other data that goes through there. So the idea itself is bad already. And so it's so if you if you implement it, this won't get better. And there's a different problem that's called lock-in. I don't know if this really fits in here, but I think it's important enough that if we go around and uh, distribute levels that we should look at this. So for example, some kind of library that does exactly what I want, but it only runs in the Amazon cloud. So then my freedom of using what kind of platform I want to use is, has been restricted. That's something you have to communicate in advance. Or in cryptographic code, the, the assembler is hand optimized for the uh, for the architecture. But if you're in a border, uh, if you're in like PowerPC or even ARM, then it does just didn't work well. That's not a hard dependency, but it just restricts the user. And while we're at it, uh, we can also look at the resource footprint. There's oftentimes there's things like, okay, we have to sort, but we only have 10, 10 elements, so we use bubble sort. And then someone comes around and adds more elements, and then it uh, doesn't work anymore. And that's also something you have to communicate, which, uh, which, uh, which scales do we work with, uh, does this code work with. But it also doesn't just uh, affect the CPU or the RAM, but also on, also, uh, on I.O. and uh, hard, hard disk space. So the problem, okay, so let's assume these are the, the dimensions. It's a little bit difficult to build a metric out of this because a good metric is between 0 and 1 or 0 and 10, so you can compare. But if, if I say we have to also look at the transitive um, dependency problem, then, then I think we have to we have to get away from this metric or score problem. Another problem is if we have a metric, then people will do gaming in order to cheat the metric and not solve the problem. So I thought, let's call it a legacy score, but we can't really use score here. So what, what else can we do? And to what does the metric apply? There's also different approaches. We could apply to the whole software, can computers kind of score for the software, like for an insurance. You, they look at how, how probable it is that I have to pay, some kind of risk assessment, or I can do it for per, per module. So, so the manager says, no, that's too, too risky, or even for the de developer, or even for per, per method. So I looked around, what, what's the prior art? What did people do before? There's an established standard from 93, and it's called the Geek Code. Who knows the Geek Code? That's for the uh, older people among you. The, the, the form formatting was a little joke on PGP. So the idea was to describe yourself yourself. So GD means Geek Education Sector. And after that, there's some kind of dimensions and a rating. So for example, S is the size, and the, they put it in their signature and distributed it in the Usenet. So everyone could have, could imagine who the other, who the other person on the end is. So people just gave away information about themselves voluntarily. But yeah, the idea wasn't bad. So let's try to implement the idea I had in su such a kind of score. And that's not really easy. 
That's why my uh, first started the uh, this talk in German, and I really would like to uh, to hear about uh, your feedback. And this is the uh, draft I made. And the idea is that the author of a library writes it in a comment, and then then you have some kind of dog whistle. And the other the other author can have a look at it, and he, he'll have an idea about about the code. This is very clear. So who owns the code? The worst case is you don't even see it. You only have a copy of it. It runs in the cloud somewhere. Then this is kind of related, but it's not exactly the same. I have the code and I can't change it, or I can only read it, or it, the source code got lost. Or the Huawei model is <laughs> the government can look uh, into it. Of course, this is kind of with a um, wink here, but the idea is very attractive. I think I'll implement this with my own code. The problem with these things is that you have to um, uh, uh, take into account that the limits are also realistic. So there's people who do the same things for 20 years. For, for example, the guy who does the set, set library, he did LZ4 before and uh, he was doing only only doing compression algorithms. So you can assume he's he knows what he's doing. But this goes down to back, uh, I'm not really the guy who wrote it. I, j I'm, I just uh, uh, inherited it. I just have to take care of it. So what about the correctness? That's another problem. That, that reaches from, yeah, well, I have proof and that uh, you can understand yourself. And, well, I have a proof, but it's maybe hard to, to, to realize. Then about the bugs, uh, whether we can uh, regularly do code audits or we try to fix the bugs. And there's the people, well, it's not really a s security problem, it just crashes. So people who don't really know what they're doing or are just evil. And uh, it's important to communicate. So most people here are at C minus. Oh, they don't even have a backtracker. That's possible, of course, as well. Then I thought, well, maybe we also have to say what kind of design it was the basis of the development. So it starts with, well, we clicked all buzzwords. We have least privilege and everything. And then there's a big jump to, well, we validate our inputs. That's also quite good already. But it goes down to, well, bullshit, blah, blah, like we have antivirus. So I think it would be nice if we had this in our software, something like a labeling system. And the idea is... The, the idea started when I bought a multivitamin packet in the US and there's a big table with the supplement facts. Well, this vitamin has this and this percentage of the daily allowance and it says something like, well, vitamin C 5000%, so it's bullshit obviously. So you also have to know what you are reading when you're reading it, but at least there is a way that we could try because it gives you more information. And this down here, author left, uh, project abandoned, it's more often than you would think. Then volatility, this tries to attack this volatility problem that people release more often than you could test it properly. But a good solution is not available, really. So what I personally would like most would be WIM, uh, is WIM. There are daily updates, but you never notice any change because the software compiles before and after everything I used or still works. So this is, I think, the optimal goal that you can reach. S the customer does not even notice if something was patched because it's still working. So the spec I mentioned before that we have to uh, mention. And there's a big spectrum also. The spec is open, short and understandable. That's quite rare. Quite often it's behind a paywall and that's basically having no spec at all because an open source guy will not buy the ISO norms for a few thousand bucks just to check if the MPEG player that he just downloaded works properly. So then we have the dependencies. 
that had to be transitive. I just don't know how to apply this to the score. If someone has an idea, please contact me. Yeah. So how how would that be in praxis? I had a few, uh, made a few examples that would like th look like this. So the problem is that the dimensions on both sides are very subjective. For a few people it might be okay not having the source code as long as there is still maintenance. So people who use Windows for example, for them it's totally okay not to have the source code. But that also means that the score is not just a number. So it must have a number for each dimension. So this now looks like, well, like it's hard to read and it is. But in Unicode it showed that after doing this for a few days, you get used to it. And I think it's a rather good idea. I also thought about using a nice name for this. I thought legacy code would be nice, but Xing already bought that. Also legacy co.de. So I hope I now will receive a lot of good ideas what could be improved or maybe other ideas that don't include a score. Maybe the whole idea is wrong but I think we as an industry have to do something now and I think reactively working doesn't work and we have to think about how to work in the development process at and get at the people who decide what dependencies to use and that those people can uh, make their decisions on a profound basis and also to give the developers motivation to do it properly so the developer can see well at this spot I don't have the standard that I want for myself. So other than that we have the microphones for a Q&A session and I also would like to accept questions for me. Thanks for the uh, attention. We use this quick break to thank everyone from the translation booths. Um, we like to have feedback. You reach us via Twitter and we will continue with the Q&A session. There's a question from the internet. Are there projects from the real world where the problem of complexity was used, it was solved correctly and where can we find it? It's quite seldom there are. There was, a few years ago, a push where many people started to publish software and uh, make, make a statement about it being very small. I'm one of those people. But it turns out that there are other projects that are uh, putting the label minimal on it, but it's actually not. For example, recently there was an announcement by a clone of Systemd written in Rust, and I'm a huge fan of Rust and not a fan of System D. So if there had been a replacement, that would have been great, but Rust doesn't do small binaries, so the binaries that come out of this are big monsters. It's minimal if if you consider the feature set, but the end product is just huge. The the guy who, who wrote this can't do anything about this because it's a Rust problem, But and they are working on that, but minimal is not complexity, it's not, not an objective measure, it's subjective. I personally always liked the software by uh, Dan Bernstein, uh, GDDNS, and uh, how code looks like that has small binaries. It's a small field, there aren't as many examples of well done software and software that is not complex at the same time. Then, microphone 10. Can that be? I have just received a signal. Micro uh, microphone 2, please. Thank you very much for those uh, interesting ideas. My question is a bit like, is that not too... Um, you do it if you want to. Is it too much CDU-like? What, what keeps me from saying I'm M++ or something like that? That's indeed a problem. And I'm not sure how and if you, know, you want to solve this. But I think if you start mm, to use this, then there's some kind of pressure from the community that that uh, stops people from lying. So my experience with the developers is that most people are good good people that uh, don't want to do bad things. They don't want to lie. So if you give them an, an opportunity to show that it's not ready, then then I think they'll do this. Except there's someone, of course, who can't really, really correctly judge this. 
you can't really get rid of this risk, but uh, but I think it's a good step uh, for people who start uh, adding a dependency to their project to give them something to see. Well, is this a, is this a series or is this just like a, a, a like a learning project? So we we have to deploy this. We'll have to see. Hey, this might go in the same direction as the question before this, but maybe we, we could introduce a judiciary system in this. So no development system from India will accept this as a malus. If, if you say, well, the development team was in India, do you think this is a good idea, how to... Do this? Uh, it's not about India. It could also be Massachusetts, but it's about it's that the team isn't the one who wrote it. It's just someone now has to work with it because they needed a maintainer. That's always a problem, and and it's, there will always be we fraudsters. But I hope that you can you can realize them because they they cho always chose the best option in every every segment. That's something you have to try out too. So my exception, my, my experience is that communities really help to to uh, improve the standard. So we just start start this, and someone else says, that, "Well, this is important, then we have to r talk about this." And that's a sign that if there's code that's be being deployed and says how vol volatile is this, and super vol volatile isn't the highest score, uh, then maybe we can transport ideas this way. Uh, okay, maybe maybe we have to take a step back and think about how we. Uh, Make a project. Yeah, I just thought about it. If this is maybe similar to what the food industry sh is being forced to do, they write in, uh, write up all the ingredients and everything. So maybe we should think about as a follow-up developing a software code um, traffic light. Yeah, that was the idea, but I, I don't think you can break it down to a score, because some parts of it this are subjective. It's not the same with uh, with food, because you have to trust the the uh, agency, and they say that's the the maximum. If it's more, then it's not good, and then you start to to bargain. But if the software says, well, well we add this and that, then you don't know this, and you say okay. And that's that's a th thing you have to leave for the end user. Because you don't want to, oh, do you want to disadvantage OCaml because because people say why, why, why there's no no core because that's not C is this better or not? So it has to be open enough. And that's why I don't believe in judges or organizations that that uh, that uh, give away these labels because that's never worked well I think and it has to come from the community. It has to work in such a way that you have a feeling that oh I'm doing something better now I can write plus plus here now that's 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 my hope I don't know if it will work. I was missing one dimension that might fit here but maybe not because we are hands-on people. How easy is it to? Uh, contribute. So, uh, how is it? How easy is it to, uh, as a consumer or as a customer, to use it and work on it yourself? Yeah, that's right. I try to picture this through the. Uh, well, I have the code and I can change it. But the, but the problem is that the one who is maintaining the code can't really judge this very well. I don't think this will work up through such a score. But w one can try it, of course. Is missing IPv6 for you a bug or a not implemented feature? That's one of the subjective questions. To me personally, it's a it's, an, it's a bug. If there's no IPv6, but but a lot of companies say, oh, well, we don't use this anyway. Intention that the community does should richten wird. Du hast CFRSS als relativ positiv Beispiel dargestellt. Vor fünf Jahren war Hardbleed in OpenSSL, das hat einen CVSS-Bug von 5,0 gehabt und Bruce Meyer kommentierte auf einer Skala von 1 bis 10, ist das Wert 11. CVSS ging gerade bis 10. Also ich sehe nicht, dass das ähm, so klappen kann und ich finde es äh, gut, dass du... Ich sehe, dass das so funktioniert, aber 
Because we don't have a standard, what does it mean to, what, what does minimal mean? If there's a two-factor two authentication, then, then is any application with a two, two factor, without two-factor automatically buggy? Uh, that's uh, an open science question. I don't have any good answers for this. So this is still a field of research. The heartbleed thing could have been solved by saying, by adding, well, what are we guaranteeing? And if the guarantees are broken, well, then it's a complete failure. But now we have features that sounds like a security feature. And if you ask for guarantees, they say, well, none. Who uses this is, well, it's their own fault. And we have to get away from this. And I think this is only working if we can help people understand that they are writing the legacy from tomorrow. People always pretend like legacy fell from the heavens. No, actually, you are writing legacy, just not from today, but from tomorrow. Another question from the internet. In your scoring scheme, how, how do you think this will work for projects where there isn't even an owner who could write this? Well, at one point, when this is really uh, deployed, the absence of a label is a sign itself, but it, that's going to take time. I mean, it's just an idea. I can't solve this. If there's no one adding a label, then maybe the community could decide this on GitHub, maybe some judicial system by the mob or by the, by the crowd. So these are rather coarse categories, especially for enterprise. It's hard to... Do you think this will incentivize developers to improve already existing software or is it rather from new software? So what do I, wanna, what do I want to achieve? So the goal is mostly to approach hobbyists because in the enterprise environment you have a completely different environment. There's someone paying for all this and the one who's paying makes the decisions. So you don't really have the, the option to go around and change the old code because there's a huge backload for things you have to do. And there's a lot of optimization so you don't really have the, the option to optimize old code so it has to be open source and in the past I di didn't have much hope for this but open source has a lot of influence by now and maybe on the open source side you don't see that so much but when you're around enterprise projects most big projects are internet based by now even appliances have internet and at least 60 to 80 percent are open source depending on what industry you're in so open source has a huge influence now so when open source said well we have to become agile then the industry also did that so if we now say we can